right this morning. Going to talk about the question Are you living with momentum? Are you living with momentum? It's kind of a follow up on what we talked about last week. As you remember, last week we looked at the question Do you really want to be helped? And I really believe there are people out there that are living their lives in misery. And they need to ask themselves that question Do you really want to be helped? And part of the help that God gives us, as we've talked about, He works in us. He gives us the desire and helps us fulfill what He wants us to do, but He gives us some responsibility as well. And as we look at the subject of living with momentum this morning, it's a little bit different message. Momentum has been defined as the strength or force that allows something to continue or grow stronger or faster as time passes. As we look at the life of Jesus, one way in which his life can be described, the life that Jesus lived here on earth, would be that he lived with momentum. He also lived with purpose and focus, two things that are very important, purpose and focus. And we see that really clearly in John chapter 17. I know we've been there a number of times over the past weeks. I just seem to keep going back to this chapter. So if you turn to John 17 this morning for our text. And let's stand for the reading of God's Word. John 17, beginning in verse 1, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, and note these next few words, the hour is come. His earthly life was winding down. He would be crucified the next day. The hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Verse 4 really gives us the purpose, the mission, the goal before Jesus. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And then he says in verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this intimate glimpse into Jesus' heart, the Father. And we ask God that today you help us to see what you want for us in our individual lives. We ask your blessings, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus came to earth with a purpose, with a mission, with really a goal before him. I see that being two parts. One, to glorify the Father. Jesus was about glorifying the Father. And two, to seek and to save that which was lost. In John 12, verses 27 and 28, we read, And now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour, Jesus says. Father, glorify thy name. And then came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You see, Jesus wanted the Father to be glorified. The very hour had come, uh, was very close by, that he would be offered up as a, as a sacrifice for our sin. John 13, Jesus said in verses 31 and 32, Therefore, when he has gone out, speaking of Judas, leaving to betray Jesus, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, 
and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Even when it came to prayer, Jesus said in John 14, 13, uh, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Jesus was about the Father being glorified. But also to seek and to save that which was lost. He would come into this world, as we're told in Matthew 121, a passage we read at Christmas time. It says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus from the very beginning came with the purpose of saving his people from their sins. In Luke 9.51 it says, And it came to pass... When the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Luke 19.10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. John 13.1 says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, as you read through the, the Gospels, you come across the phrases, His hour was not yet come, many times. But as it draws toward the end of His life, it, His hour has come, that He should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved His own, which were in the world, He loved them unto the end. So as Jesus came into this world and lived on earth, we can see He had clarity of purpose. He had focus. And in part of that focus was a cross upon which he would shed his blood and pay for the sin debt of the world. That brings us to the question we each of us have to face. Does yours and my life have direction? Jesus' life on earth had direction. It was 33 year life on earth. But it was full of direction. And I believe because that direction was there, the momentum to live it was there. So we have to consider, are we directing our lives toward God's purpose, mission, goal for us? Or is the busyness of life and its controlling circumstances driving you? See, that's so easy. It's so easy to get so busy... And then all the various responsibilities and the things of life come in and they are actually driving us. And that means that something outside of God is controlling the directions we go. Missionary martyr Jim Elliott said, Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. You see, as we talk about living with momentum, we can't even get into that until we touch on the whole idea of, of purpose. You know, Rick Warren years ago had a bestseller called uh, The Purpose Driven Life. And then he followed that book up with The Purpose Driven Church. Well, what I got out of both of those books, and I read them both, was purpose is important. Okay? And God lays out clearly for us His purpose for us in His Word. I want to give you today five observations about living with momentum. You might say, well, you're talking about purpose and then you're going back to momentum. Yeah, but just bear with me because the first thing is momentum needs to be directed toward a purpose, goal, or mission. Momentum needs to be directed toward a purpose, goal, or mission. If we have no purpose in life, if we have no goal in life, but just to get from uh, the beginning of the work week to the end of the work week and just relax and live for ourselves on the weekend, if that's life and we get in that, that rotation, uh, it, we just get so caught up in it. We get in a, a rut of it. But when we have a purpose beyond just ourselves, beyond just our own happiness, our own satisfaction. It takes us forward. I'll give you five purposes this morning. 
that I see clearly in Scripture that God has for each one of you that's a born-again believer. Now this morning we're talking about, in the, these purposes, Christians. People that have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. Five purposes. One, that you glorify Him in all that you do. That you glorify God in all that you do. Whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, glorify God in it. You know, He uses something as simplistic as whether we eat or whether we drink. Something we do all the time. Some of us a little more than others. But He says we're to do it for His glory. That God would be lifted up. That God would be magnified. That uh, radiance would be shed upon Him. Also, that you have an intimate relationship with Him. A close relationship. He's not just some distant God out there that we can't touch and reach out to and that cannot be touched with the feelings that we struggle with in, in our prayers. Also, and we talked about this in our Sunday school class this morning, that we become like Christ. Reflect the character of God. Romans 8.29 says that God's purpose is that He predestinated us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Also, according to Mark 16, verse 15, that we reach the lost with the gospel. That's a responsibility that has been given to us individually, and that's a responsibility that's been given to us corporately as a church. So, we individually are to reach out to those in our areas of influence, those we have uh, contact with, those that are in our community. And then as a church, we go even beyond those in our area of influence. We go out into the regions beyond here. That's why we have uh, missionary support in Wales, in Israel, in Nepal, in various places. <coughs> also, that yours and my life brings pleasure to God. Look with me, if you would, to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. You have a heavenly scene there in Revelation 4.11, and it's a scene, I believe, of the four and twenty elders who I believe to be representative of the church. Some would disagree with that. And also, um, you have in verse 9, uh, the beast, which I believe would be angels. And it says in verse 11, as they're before the throne, uh, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. We're created for God's pleasure. We get it backwards. Have you noted that? We live this life in this world like we are put here just to enjoy life. That life is it, and that's when, you know, live it to the fullest, and then we die. Oh, and then we'll go to heaven and be with God, and everything will be great. But we don't look forward to that, do we? Not like we should. God's purpose for us, that He created us, was to, for, for, him to for our lives to bring Him pleasure. Now, everything got derailed when sin came into the picture. But because of our relationship with Christ, everything can be put back in its right perspective. That's not to say that we're going to be perfect overnight. It's not to say we're not going to have struggles, that we're not going to many times fail the Lord. But we now have a renewed relationship with Him, one that sin broke, the, the blood of Christ is repaired, and we have these purposes. These are purposes that are clear in God's Word for believers. So we don't have to just kind of wonder, what does God... Any of you ever wondered, what does God want me to do? Why am I here? Well, you're here to glorify God. You are here to have an intimate, close relationship with Him. Scripture says, again, in, in uh, James, if we draw near to God, He will what? Draw near to us. Um, you're here to grow in Christ's likeness. You're here to be used to reach the lost. You're here to bring pleasure to God. So, 
as you think about this, ask yourself this. What is your life moving toward? What is your life moving toward? Again, many times it's just living. It's just getting through. It's getting from paycheck to paycheck with hopes of a, a nice two-week vacation somewhere at some point. But what is, is that in line with what God wants us to, to be living toward? I recommend that each of you as a believer write out a life purpose statement or a mission statement of your own. I brought mine today to read to you. I think I've read this years ago here. But this is what I wrote down as to why I believe I live. Okay, I exist to glorify God with my life and to become more like Christ. To grow in a love relationship with Him and display His character to others. To carry out His mission in the world and in my areas of influence. Now those areas of influence for me is my family, my friends, those I come in contact with. But having just a simple statement like this gives your life some direction. You go back and read it and you say, is this really the direction my life is headed? You know, we could easily say, well, I've got to earn money. I've got to provide for my family. I've got to have fun. But what I'm trying to say this morning, let's, let's come out of what we see on our level and say, what does God really want for us? What does he really want? So if we're going to talk about living with momentum, momentum needs to be directed toward a purpose, goal, or mission. Secondly, though, there is strength in obedience. There's strength. When we talk about momentum in our lives, there's strength. When we start obeying God, we build momentum in that direction. You ever find it hard to do what the Lord wants? You ever find it's like part of you is wanting to do what God wants, part of you is wanting to do something different, and there's like this struggle going on inside. And if you want to do what God wants, there's strength. There's strength in obedience. That's where our momentum, the, when we start obeying God. It's been said, I was reading some quotes, and it said, if you are on the right track and just sit there, you'll get run over. So often we get on the right track, you know. We deal with some things that we know we've been dealing, struggling with. Maybe we clean up our language. Maybe we get rid of a few things we shouldn't be doing. And we start coming to church. And, you know, we get settled in then to that mode. But, you know, I find, and I was talking somewhat to the Sunday school class this morning about this, if we're not careful, we get into living a superficial Christian life. Just one that's surface. And there's so much more depth that God wants us to have than what we get on the surface many times. And that's where I really and truly in my heart want to dig down. I want more of Him. I want, as Kelsey alluded to, and we've been talking about some, I want to enjoy God. You know, our weeks and our lives don't always go as we planned. You know, and we can get really thrown off from that. I know I do at times. But the question is, God is allowing me to experience what I experience in this life. And he's, part of why he's allowing that is to give me an opportunity to grow in Christ-likeness, an opportunity to witness to some people, an opportunity to bring him glory and pleasure. And if I'm all caught up and bent out of shape because it's not going the way I want it, that's really not for me to be bent out of shape about, is it? Because if I'm God's and He's in control, I really can sit back and trust that I'm in capable hands. It's, it's how does God want me to respond in a particular given situation. So the, there's strength of obedience. Then third, the benefit of focus. The benefit of focus. You know, in life, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Reminds me of the first time I went over and shot a gun at Herman Dawes' house. That man probably just sat there and I could just, you know, it was terrible. And I was aiming at something, but I didn't hit it. But if you aim at nothing, 
Think about this. Let this sink in. You'll hit it every time. If you just let circumstances and the busyness of life control you, you know something? You're not going to be leading. The life is going to be leading you. Momentum is maintained as we keep our purpose in focus. Okay? You write out the purpose statement I'm talking about. Guess what? If you never ever go back and look at it, you won't remember what it says. Unless you can, you're a good memory person and you can just kind of repeat it to yourself continuously. But if Kenny wants to ask these children up here one day, why are you here? What is your purpose for being here? You know, that'd be a good, good thought for a child. What is your purpose? Because adults struggle with that. I think that's why Rick Warren's books were so uh, much of a success, because it dealt with something that people need in, in this life, and that's purpose. Purpose. I remember they were speaking at the funeral of Dr. Harold Wilmington, speaking of the later days of his life, and this was said, and I wrote it down. Speaking of Dr. Wilmington, a man whose mind was not fixed on the pain of today, but on the promise of tomorrow. Think about it. A man whose mind was not fixed on the pain of today, but the promise of tomorrow. Isn't that kind of how we should live? Not that we have natural physical pain every day, but we have things that come up each day, don't we? That can so easily zap us of our joy. Get us off focus. Get us complaining. Get us to the point that we are anything but enjoying God. We have an example of Jesus. If you'd look with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we also were compassed about with so great a crowd of, cloud of witnesses, and this is referring back to the people of faith in chapter 11, he says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth, doth so easily beset us. In other words, lay aside things that are going to hinder us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So the Christian life is likened to a race. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He started our faith. He completes our faith. It says looking unto Jesus, that's our focus. Our focus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Then we have the example of the Apostle Paul, if you would look in um, Philippians 3 with me. Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Now get this. Make sure you get it. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now let's think about this. Forgetting those things which are behind. Not relying on past achievements or dwelling on sins and failures. How often do we do that? We either live in the past. I used to do this. There were the days that I served God. There were the days I was faithful to the things of God. I used to witness. I used to teach a Sunday school class. I used to do these, you know. And we focus on past achievements. But then there's past sins and failures we can focus on as well. The times that we really did want to do what's right, and we didn't, and now we just feel defeated and discouraged and like almost throwing up our hands and saying, what's the use in trying? 
But the Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, whether they are achievements, whether they are failures, how about whether they're even past heartaches and scars? It's been said, scars remind us of where we've been. They don't have to dictate where we're going. I wonder how many people in here today have scars from the past. I'm not talking about the physical scars on their hand. We got, we got those two probably, but the, the scars in our hearts. And you know, as, again, that, that quote makes so much sense. Scars remind us of where we've been. They don't have to dictate where we're going. In other words, those who created yesterday's pain in your life do not control tomorrow's potential unless we continue living in the past. One of the worst things that kills momentum is looking back. If you want momentum and be hidden in a particular direction and really have the thrust of life going for you, but you're looking back instead of at your purpose, your goal, your mission, you take your focus off of what God wants you to focus on and you're looking back, you might end up doing a face plant. And I mean a real one. Because you're not got the momentum. You're coming to a point in life that your momentum is hindered. Why? Keep looking back. You see, to be distracted by the past hinders the progress in the future. I like the way John MacArthur said it. He said, to be distracted by past deliberately, I'm sorry, to be distracted by the past deliberately, I'm having a real hard time pronouncing this. Thing. Debilitates one's efforts in the future, present. Okay, got past that. He got to keep the momentum going. Notice he says here, press toward. I press toward the mark. We're talking about aggressive, energetic action. Believers must not stagnate or plateau in their spiritual growth. But how often do we do that? We do that when we lose living with momentum. We lose momentum when we don't keep the purpose and the focus before us. Notice he says, I press toward the mark for the prize. Okay? The goal is Christ likeness. The prize is Christ likeness in heaven. Because you see, as we talked about, once again, I refer back to Sunday school because we covered quite a bit today, but at salvation, you were positionally set apart to God. You were positionally sanctified or made holy. When you're, die, when you're dead and you're in heaven, you're going to be, you're going to be perfectly sanctified. You know, you're going to, you're going to be like Jesus. The one that we have to deal with is the progressive or the practical side of holiness or sanctification. And that's what we have to deal with every day of our lives. And some days are good days. Some days are not good days. So the thing of it is, is as we consider this, there will come a day that we will be like Christ. But in this life, there is a goal to pursue. And that goal is Christ's likeness. Then there's a caution I want to give you. The caution is when you're gaining momentum in your life, the likelihood of demonic oppression or attacks increase. That's not a place Satan wants you to be. Does not want Christians to have momentum in their life. In other words, he wants very much to get your eyes off of the purposes God has for you. And the way he does that many times is to get our eyes either on our past or on our present negative circumstances. Have you ever noticed when you're negative and you really stay there, park it there for any length of time, it only makes a bad situation worse? And then lastly, there's momentum either gained or lost in our lives. Our choices either provide us with momentum or diminish us of momentum. Choices. Give you some very practical things. How about the choices of how we care for our bodies? 
Okay? Well, how does that deal with momentum or not? Well, if say you're going to set yourself up and you're going to lose a certain amount of weight, how do you lose momentum? You indulge in too many cinnamon rolls. Okay? If you do that on a regular basis, you lose momentum. You got to say, is this cinnamon roll worth the momentum I'm going to lose? I mean, that might be something we can laugh at, but it's very realistic. Our choices have consequences. More specifically, our daily choices have consequences. Choices about how we spend our time either diminish our momentum or increase our momentum. Choices about how we either get this, respond or react. And there is a difference. Choices about the priority of God in our lives. Every one of you made a choice this morning to get up, come to church or not. You can build on that momentum of faithfulness. Then the times we, we choose when we could be together as believers not to come, then that diminishes our momentum. You know, you've heard people say sometimes it's easy to, easy to get out of doing what you should do. It is, because we lose momentum. Choices regarding obedience or disobedience. All of these things go into it, it whether we are gaining momentum or losing it in our life. As we live with momentum, we're going toward God's goal, God's purpose, God's mission. You could even take some of the stuff I'm sharing today and take God out of the equation, and Christians live successfully doing that many times. But we have a Savior that has set the example for us. A quote that is in the bulletin today that I think says this well, it's, failure to continue to walk in God's light or failure to accept and use God-given opportunities can bring loss of the power of the Spirit. And when I look at that, I think my failure to continue to walk in the light God gives me or failure to accept and use His God-given opportunities, I lose the momentum that God's Spirit will give me in being what God wants me to be. Momentum is something we may not think about a lot, but it's important. Let's bow our heads.